Welcome everyone to a international relations capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today we will deal with the war drums being heard in Ukraine. In, fift, in fact, if there are two hot spots in the world today, which are likely to develop into a conflict, are both in Eurasia. One end is uh, Taiwan, and the other end is Ukraine. In Taiwan, it is the, the Chinese who are likely to go to war, and in Ukraine, it's likely to be the Russians. So all others seem to be out of this. And these are uh, limited interests of these countries, but the whole world is involved in one way or the other. In fact, some people may say that this war in Ukraine has been going on for some time. Uh, it is not just uh, war drums or war clouds, but actual war in that sense. Because since February 2014, uh, when uh, Crimea was taken away, from Ukraine by Russia. There has been this tension and also off and on uh, some conflicts. So some people see it as a continuing uh, Russo-Ukrainian Ukraine war going on since February 2014. Uh, but that was a separate incident and some years have passed. Very many things have happened. And uh, now again, the, one can see the uh, signs of uh, conflict emerging. Uh, but nobody thinks that there will be a war immediately, even though the president of Ukraine keeps saying that today there is a threat, tomorrow there will be a war. So he is very uh, particularly concerned that uh, this might happen because he knows the Russians he claims. But let us get back to history for a while to remember how this has all come about. Uh, as you all know, Ukraine was one of the Soviet Socialist Republics, one of the big ones, and one of the closest ones to Moscow, because the language is the same. I have been to Ukraine, and there is no real difference between Russia and Ukraine, culturally or linguistically. And um, so they were very close, and also historically, Ukraine became a member of the United Nations in 1945 itself. Even though it was part of the Soviet Union, as a part of a deal to give the East Europeans some numbers in the UN, otherwise they would be totally outnumbered, two republics of the Soviet Union were also inducted as members of the United Nations. That is Ukraine and Belarusia. So USSR could count on three votes for themselves whenever something happened in the United Nations. And that was generally accepted, even though both these uh, delegations of Ukraine and Belarusia worked like the delegations of Soviet Union. I dealt with them and they didn't have a policy, anything different from the Soviet policy. So, but it was a convenient arrangements for the Soviet Union to have some extra support within the UN General Assembly. And then when the Soviet Union broke up, fortunately, Soviet Union broke up rather peacefully, unlike in Yugoslavia, where there were several conflicts and even wars. And uh, Moscow, Russia, having inherited uh, the uh, Soviet Union's uh, policies and assets, and also the permanent seat on the Security Council, so they were very responsible. In fact, you may know that the UN Charter still speaks about the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics as the permanent member. There is no such country. But the Charter has not been amended because nobody wanted to have a debate about it because all the 15 republics could have claimed uh, to inherit the Soviet uh, heritage. But it was all quietly done because the world was aware of the reality and there was no point in wasting time by having these disputes. And so quietly, one day, Soviet Union's flag was brought down and Russian flag went up in the UN. And Russian Federation was kept as the name of the permanent member of the Security Council. 
But someone who reads the text of the UN Charter will wonder what has happened to this particular permanent member who doesn't exist in the world. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that it was a cordial kind of relationship. And it had continued uh, for quite some time. Uh, there, were, um, uh, there was a council of foreign and defense policies of which Russia was a member and the, all the other republics. And um, uh, quite a friendly and uh, cooperative relationship with Russia. Uh, but somehow they always remembered that uh, one part of Ukraine that was Crimea was in fact given away to Ukraine in 1954 by Khrushchev. And um, when Ukraine became independent and uh, began nursing hopes about being close to the European Union, uh, Russia started worrying about it. Uh, because Ukraine is a big country and uh, with uh, Crimea attached to it, it had a rather significant uh, position in Europe and uh, the European Union. And this Russia considered to be some kind of a, a threat because first European Union and then it could be NATO. And that is something that uh, Russia could not accept. That a, that a country like Ukraine would be in the European Union, that is bad enough, trade-wise and economic, uh, economically. But if it also got, you know, graduates to become a NATO member, and that will be a matter of concern for you know, Russia. Because unlike the Eastern Bloc, the Western Bloc, NATO, was not demolished. NATO continues to be uh, an alliance, active alliance, intervening sometimes in uh, various areas other than anti-communist or anti-Soviet activities. And so NATO has uh, emerged as a, as a continuing military alliance in, uh, in Europe. And that is causing some concern to Russia because they had wound up their empire. And here was a threat from the other empire. And therefore, they be the there was some restlessness. And um, eventually, when the um, European Union was uh, considering membership and uh, Ukraine was thinking in terms of uh, um, getting closer to the uh, European Union, uh, in February 2014, uh, Russia demand, made a demand uh, for returning Crimea to Russia because it was originally given uh, by the Soviet Union to um, Crimea, sorry, to, uh, to Ukraine. So there was a referendum held, which uh, most countries in the world did not recognize. And um, uh, Crimea became a part of Russia, which was separated away from, from Ukraine. And there was a lot of uh, criticism there were economic sanctions against Russia. Russia was considered an occupying power. And it was felt that uh, even by the time it was 2019, almost 7% of Ukrainian territory was under Russian occupation. So, since it was only transferred in 1954, historically perhaps there were some uh, justification of the reintegration of uh, uh, Crimea to uh, with uh, Crimea with uh, with Russia. So Ukraine abandoned this. It's a nuclear arsenal. Ukraine, as part of the Soviet Union, had housed a number of nuclear reactors and other activities. And when they became independent, the question arose as to what will happen to the nuclear assets of Ukraine. Uh, but Ukraine, uh, without any hesitation, surrendered the nuclear arsenal to Russia. Otherwise, that would have been a point of contention, which was not there. And then the Charter of European Security, with the inherent right of every 
participating state to choose security arrangements was also there. There was a charter of European security. So all this um, prepared the ground for Ukraine to uh, be comfortable with the European Union and also have more linkages. Then in September 2013, there was a free free trade agreement with the European Union and um, that strengthened Ukraine pos Ukrainian position. And, um, uh, and Russian uh, forces, whichever they are in Ukraine at any point, they are all withdrawn. So the Problems the started recently when uh, Ukraine uh, requested to speed up its membership of NATO. That I think was the, the provocation. And uh, one started hearing about building up Russian military build up in their own territory, but rather aggressively on the on the borders. But uh, strengthening your own forces in your own territory is not wrong, whatever may be your perception about uh, the threat to your country, and therefore it is fairly justifiable. And uh, when the, the problem arose, the United States uh, started looking at the situation, and um, there was uh, some indication uh, from President Biden, that um, there will be some commitment to the sovereignty of Ukraine. So this further exasperated the situation because uh, Vladimir Putin, who became emerged as a strong man of Russia, uh, had his eyes on keeping Ukraine under control, and he was not going to accept some kind of an arrangement by which Ukraine broke away, as it were, from the from the eastern arrangements and um, so therefore uh, there is this uh, tension growing actually in uh, uh, on the border and uh, the president of uh, ukraine mr zelensky has been talking about his concern um, at one point he ukraine president said that uh, he did not accuse russia but he said that Russian representatives are planning to overthrow the Ukrainian government as soon as next week, he said. And he was accusing uh, a leading businessman having been involved in it. And uh, he, of course, denied any involvement. And then the president of Ukraine said that he may not know himself that he's a part of this. And this is some, some kind of a, of a coup which is being planned by the Russians in uh, Ukraine. So this uh, businessman was named and he's one of the richest men. He was dragged into the plan. And of course, he himself uh, denied it. And uh, Moscow uh, said that it, uh, Russia has no such plans uh, to get involved in uh, Ukraine. And um, and Moscow simply dismissed it as alarmist about the build-up. Uh, but the NATO Secretary General, who has an eye on uh, Ukraine's membership of uh, NATO, um, uh, warned, we have a warning to Russia that any kind of use of force will be at uh, great cost. And Mr. Zelensky, the Ukraine president said that this is a very dangerous rhetoric, he called it. So generally, there is a, an impression among the Ukrainians uh, that something is afoot. Even though repeated assurances have been given by the Russians that they have no such in intention, uh, the number of Russian troops amassed on the border uh, is what is causing concern. Of course, there is a large part of the Russian forces in Crimea, which is now part of Russia, which Russia announced 
took away from uh, Ukraine in March 2014. So uh, the troops also massing near the eastern region of uh, uh, Ukraine. And there is some background to some conflicts which have taken place between Russia and some of the regions in the eastern part of uh, Ukraine. So the richest man, his name is uh, Renat Akhmatov, a businessman, and uh, he was outraged by the charge made against him. And um, he, he uh, accused uh, Ukrainians, I mean, the Russians, for having uh, created all this. But the, the, the seriousness of uh, the troops which virtually surrounds Ukraine is something of concern to everybody. And what exactly they are planning is not known. But one thing is certain, the Russians have said it very clearly, that the moment, this is what they said, the moment Ukraine joins NATO, there will be trouble. And that warning they have given, large scale. So there is really no window of diplomacy after that. And that is why People are engaged in diplomatic activity. President uh, Biden said the other day that he would perhaps speak to both um, the Russian President Putin and the Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, to see that uh, no conflagration takes place, no war breaks out. Um, Biden had some involvement in Ukraine and President Trump tried to use his son's name to involve Biden in uh, Ukrainian politics and uh, business. Of course, that failed because Biden won the elections, but that was a Trump card that uh, President Trump had tried to use during the elections. So, so no, uh, any, any invasion has been, uh, has been ruled out by the Russians. The US intelligence assessment uh, that uh, there is a threat by the Russian soldiers on Ukraine. So last April, uh, Russia sent uh, uh, some uh, troops even closer to Ukrainian border. And it was after that, that uh, there was this meeting between Putin and Biden. And that was partly an effort to defuse the crisis in Ukraine. And they had a good meeting in Geneva. And therefore, uh, there was some uh, uh, sense of security and peace after the Geneva uh, summit. But there's always, there are always people who uh, create problems. Russia's um, some uh, Turkish drones were uh, f flying in the Ukrainian uh, airspace. And uh, there were around 90,000 troops. Russian troops are on the borders of Ukraine, but a small country like that. Um, the Putin is not likely to escalate tensions because he knows that that will involve the United States in the conflict. And so, he is willing to uh, talk uh, to, the, uh, to the Americans or to the Ukrainians. Uh, but, and he feels that he can have a deal with Biden on this issue after their Geneva meeting. Um, the Ukrainian Prime Minister has been saying that uh, in, Leo, in, in the context of uh, uh, the Russian amassing of troops, uh, NATO should send warships to the Black Sea uh, to observe what the Russian planes are doing in the, in the region. Uh, but Ukraine is also willing to have some kind of peace deals. And uh, Biden spoke to Ukrainian president sometime earlier, uh, pledging unwavering support to Ukraine's uh, sovereignty. And Russia's claim is only that it is free to move its troops to any part of its territory and it should not be a cause for concern. 
so this is the general situation and um, the us have said that all options are open that is the latest statement from the united states uh, that all options are open in order to prevent any kind of uh, conflict uh, between ukraine and uh, and russia uh, but um, they are very clear that if nato expands to the east russia will have to change the system and draw new red lines and that is the last warning that uh, russia has given so what do we read out of all this and what is it that as uh, students of international relations you need to remember because you need to remember the history of uh, relationship between soviet union and ukraine and also the uh, tendency of uh, the uh, the division of uh, or, or the breaking up of the soviet union was fairly peaceful and therefore there should be no reason for any kind of confrontation unless there is a provocation so here the provocation is eu and nato and the eu and nato are of course very keen to get ukraine into their uh, embrace and which is very natural because that will give them some advantage to um against russia in containing uh, russia in the uh, in europe because europe russia is really growing after the european union lost the uh, uk uh, russia has become a significant power uh, in europe so like in the case of uh, uh, taiwan where also there are war clouds there will be effort made by the united states in taiwan as well as in ukraine not to provoke a war and so far president biden has not talked or planned wars in any part of the world because in a sense president trump also did not but he made so many noises all the time that we did not know whether he was making war or peace <laughs> though he did not send any troops and in fact we decided to withdraw troops from uh, um afghanistan and that's why he was claiming the nobel prize for peace because he didn't send any troops anywhere he did not uh, cause any war of course he killed an iranian general in iraq as probably one act of war he provoked he could have broken into a war if the iranians were not uh, cautious and uh, careful so except for that he has a good record president trump had and president biden of course even a better record in trying to uh resolve differences uh without breaking them into into conflict but that is a message that he gave to president xi when they had their virtual meeting so perhaps all of us can sleep peacefully without thinking that there will be a war breaking out this is not very far from india as you know and also no war breaking out in taiwan uh but we should be aware of the seriousness of the situation and uh, since 2014 the relationship between ukraine and uh, russia had not been very pleasant and uh, therefore it is possible and every sign is there that both the sides are uh, getting ready for a for a conflict or a peace deal on the basis of fear because most very often war clouds come and war drums are beaten not really to fight a war uh but to create a solution or a peace which is favorable to them so to create that strong position when you negotiate with your rivals you create this kind of situation pakistan does it all the time china does it all the time we don't know whether it is peace or war with china they are they are still there they are not being disengaged but nobody talks about it as a war so there are so many ways in which you can flex your muscles particularly because the geopolitical situation is in a flux because though united states is still the leading power in the world the richest country and the strongest army etc uh, china also makes claims that in a few years at least they will catch up with the united states 
Russia has also ambitions, both Russia and China are building up their nuclear arsenals, we know. And so everybody is keeping their powder dry. And uh, so it is in that context that we have to observe the situation uh, in uh, the so-called Russo-Ukrainian war. There is no war, but the war we started in 2014 has not really been resolved and provocation continues. And like in the case of China, Taiwan, United States is committed to protecting the sovereignty of Ukraine. So there are elements in the situation which can prove dangerous. And the president of Ukraine is speaking of a war or a conflict or a coup by 1st of December, which is just two days from now. And that's why I thought I would bring your attention to this particular situation. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's, uh, that is related to it, but uh, not directly. There, Belarus is uh, supposed to be pushing refugees into, into Poland to provoke them. And some people say this is being done by Ukraine in order to counter Russia. So all these are going on. But that is not related to this particular issue of uh, Ukraine's uh, worry about Russian build-up. All right. Thank you very much.